Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Nonviolence International's YouTube channel. In this latest installment of the Spotlight series, I have the great privilege and honor of speaking with David Hartso. David Hartso is a Quaker, lifelong peace activist, and author of the memoir, Waging Peace, Global Adventures of a Lifelong Activist. He is a co-founder of World Beyond War, a global movement to end all war, and Nonviolent Peace Force, which has teams of nonviolent peacemakers working in conflict areas around the world. David has been a part of many nonviolent movements over the last half century, the civil rights movement, the anti-nuclear testing movement, the movement to end the Vietnam War, the US Central America peace movement, the anti-apartheid movement, and the movements to end the US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. He has used his body to block Navy ships headed for Vietnam and trains loaded with munitions on their way to El Salvador and Nicaragua. He has crossed borders to meet the enemy in East Berlin, Castro's Cuba, and present-day Iran. His first arrest was for taking part in the first civil rights sit-ins in Maryland and Virginia in 1960, and he has been arrested for nonviolent civil disobedience more than 150 times. He is a hero and an inspiration to so many. And Mr. Hartso, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you. Good to talk with you and to, with all the people that might be listening or watching. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as a college student at Howard University, you participated in sit-ins to desegregate lunch counters in Maryland and Virginia. What was that experience like? And from my understanding, you faced violence and intimidation. And I'm wondering, how did you stay committed to nonviolence um, in the face of that? Well, first to back up a little bit, um, mm -hmm. four students in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, had uh, decided they'd had it with segregation and mm -hmm. uh, went to a Woolworths drug store <laughs> to get something to eat. And uh, instead of getting something to eat, they were arrested. Mm -hmm. um, that was a spark, uh, a nonviolent spark <laughs> that uh, encouraged and gave uh, uh, inspiration to young people, especially African American people all over the South, to begin um, uh, challenging segregation in their own communities, going to lunch counters and um, and we got similar treatment <laughs> to the people in, uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, at Howard University, where I was a student, uh, with it, I think the next Saturday after the citizens began, we began picketing uh, Woolworth's Stroke Store. Um, and before long, we uh, realized that in Maryland and Virginia, still everything was segregated. Mm -hmm. Even African ambassadors on their way to the United, from, from the UN to Washington, could not eat along Highway 40, which was the main <laughs> highway. And we, we, we began going to Maryland to get uh, something to eat at uh, lunch counters. And, uh, and each time we would do this, which was usually on a Saturday, uh, we would get arrested and uh, spend the weekend in, in jail, not feeling sorry for ourselves, <laughs> but, but singing freedom songs and getting to know each other and uh, strategizing for uh, the long struggle still ahead. Uh, the state of Virginia had passed a law saying that everyone uh, who uh, challenged segregation there could get a six month uh, jail, prison, jail time, and uh, $500 fine. So all spring we kept going to Maryland uh, <laughs> for understandable reasons. Um, uh, Lincoln Rockwell, who was the head of the American Nazi Party and lived in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, was uh, threatened violence to anybody that challenged segregation. Uh, in Virginia. And 
we finally in June, after our final exams, nobody had challenged uh, the, the segregation laws in Virginia. And we decided somebody had to. <laughs> we did additional nonviolence training and went down to Arlington uh, to just across the bridge uh, from Washington, D.C. I uh, went to a people's drugstore and uh, it, well, they did, did the, the owner apparently did not want the publicity, so he did not arrest us, but he also wasn't going to serve us <laughs> any food uh, or, or drink. And we sat there for two days uh, waiting for something to eat. And it was uh, the most challenging two days of my life. Um, people spat at us. They put lit, lit cigarettes uh, down our shirts. They, uh, they punched us in the stomach, uh, sometimes so hard we would fall on the floor and then they would kick us. Uh, the American Nazi party did come uh, with their swastikas and <laughs> ready for battle. And um, each time that something uh, would happen to us or being said to us, we would try to respond in a peaceful, nonviolent, loving way, mm -hmm. as uh, was the um, was happening all over the South at the encouragement of SNCC. I mean, that was one of the guidelines, as we are not nonviolent movement. And um, so we had a lot of opportunity those two days <laughs> to try to practice our nonviolence. <laughs> and uh, toward the end of the second day, I was uh, reading from the New Testament, the little pocket New Testament I had, mm -hmm. saying, um, you know, loving your enemies. And I was trying to meditate on that. And I heard this guy come up from behind me saying, uh, if you don't get out of this store in two seconds, I'm going to stab this through your heart. And in his hand was a switchblade, <laughs> which by that time was half an inch from my heart. And I had literally two seconds to decide, do I really believe in nonviolence? Mm. Or is there a, <laughs> a better way to, to deal with this <laughs> hateful, terrible guy? And uh, we'd had a lot of practice. And I just uh, looked him in the eye. And I said, uh, friend, do what you believe is right. But I'll still try to love you. Mm. And it was. Uh, one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Uh, his face that was contorted with hatred uh, and his knife, his hand was shaking back and forth in front of my heart. Uh, and his hand began to fall and his jaw began to drop and he left the store. So at the age of uh, 20, <laughs> that was a pretty powerful experience about uh, the power of nonviolence on a personal level. But we did, then did something even more challenging, I think. Uh, 500 people were gathered outside. This had been in the front page of the newspaper. Uh, you know, filled with hatred and with rocks and mm -hmm. threatening violence. And we went to the front door of this uh, drugstore and uh, read a statement appealing to the religious and community leaders of Arlington to, um, and business leaders to uh, open the, the uh, eating facilities for everyone. And, um, and then we, this was the hard part. We said, if nothing changes in a week, we'll be back. <laughs> and some friendly media people got us out alive. Their cars were parked <laughs> right immediately in front of the store. And uh, we went back to Howard, and it was like uh, crossing the bridge. It was like entering the freedom land. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were free at last. <laughs> but we uh, went back to Howard and, and literally shook mm -hmm. <laughs> in our shoes for uh, six days, whether we have the courage to go back and do this again. And on the sixth day, we got a phone call that the 
religious and community leaders had met in Arlington and had talked with the business leaders and got a commitment to open the eating facilities to everyone within, uh, within 10 days. And uh, I think this was probably the most important lesson of my life, that when mm -hmm. something terrible like you know, the segregation is happening, uh, instead of cursing the television set or the president or, or segregation or war, we find some other people that believe as deeply as we do about something, mm -hmm. get some nonviolent training and go out and challenge that injustice mm -hmm. or that, that violence. And uh, that's essentially what I've been trying to do most of my life. As far as your second question about how we could be nonviolent I mean, I think one, uh, this was kind of, uh, or this was the spirit and the commitment of students all over the South. I mean, that was what was being asked of us. Mm -hmm. And we were part of this movement. We weren't just a stray group of, <laughs> of folks from, from Howard University. Um, and uh, I guess second, I, I do believe that there is something of, of good and of um, uh, a good heart in every person mm -hmm. uh, that has the potential uh, to uh, respond to a loving nonviolent acts. And um, I think my belief, that belief was just uh, uh, strongly endorsed <laughs> by our experience in the sit-ins. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I don't know, I've often, I've, I've often thought back, you know, if I had tried anything else, if I had done nothing, <laughs> just mm -hmm. let him, <laughs> that, and that wouldn't have helped much. Uh, if I had, you know, tried to punch him in the, in the base, uh, and get knock him unconscious before he got me. Um, uh, as soon as I, I might have saved my life momentarily, mm. but as soon as he came back to, he would have even more hatred mm -hmm. of, of white uh, people who have uh, uh, been traitors <laughs> to their cause, so to speak, <laughs> or, or, or to you know black people. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think by, by responding nonviolently, I did kind of touch something in his soul mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe we are one human family <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, and this guy, he was no, I, I mean, I was no longer the, this guy, this terrible guy that was, challenging uh, segregation in, in the South that he had grown up with as being uh, the law of the land and what made sense. Um, I, I was also a human being reaching out to him as a, a fellow human being. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that is a really powerful story. Um, I think what's incredible about that is the fact that you and the people you were with were college students when you were doing this. I mean, I recently graduated college in May and I'm wondering, what do you think college students can learn uh, today, can learn from your experience? Well, I think lots of college students all over the country uh, have already learned mm. <laughs> in terms of environmental questions, mm. especially. <laughs> realize that um, the climate change it, uh, can really impact uh, you know the rest of their life mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and maybe you know could even be deadly mm -hmm. uh, to the whole human race and are not just you know sitting in their at their desk, and say you know, how terrible this is, yeah. or let's say, ignore it and pretend, let's go out and party. Mm -hmm. uh, but are getting out in the streets 
in our um, building sustained movements mm -hmm. to, to, to challenge us. And Greta Thunberg in, <laughs> in uh, <clears throat> Sweden is, is a beautiful example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what one person can do. <laughs> you know, instead yes. of going to classes on Friday, she decided to uh, go and sit in front of whatever it was, the, the Capitol building or, or whatever, mm -hmm. quietly, all alone. And that has inspired millions of young people over the country, all over the world, to, um, well, I, I, I can't remain silent. <laughs> I've got to do something. And, and students are organizing. Uh, and I think we all can have influence on other people mm -hmm. through our example. I mean, it was, I had visited Montgomery, Alabama and uh, back when I was 15 years old and got inspired by uh, the courageous people there that, you know, were uh, no longer willing to ride the buses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in a segregated basis. And we're getting up an hour earlier to walk to work, we're getting home an hour earlier. Um, and to ride the bus was, would have been the most convenient thing, <laughs> or it was mm -hmm. the most convenient thing. Mm -hmm. But they were willing to even suffer themselves, and even when black churches were bombed. They refused to, to bomb the, the, uh, the white churches. Um, and the power of uh, I, people seeing dictators getting overthrown by nonviolent mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, they, uh, I mean, the, the courage of the people in, in the Philippines during the Marcos dictatorship <laughs> to, to face the tanks mm -hmm. and, the, and the same in Moscow mm -hmm. in 1991, uh, facing the tanks with flowers <laughs> and, and offering bread and uh, and, and water and cigarettes. Uh, I mean, and then the, the guys got out of the tanks and joined the people <laughs> instead of firing as they'd been ordered to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all of this, we have influence on each other. And I think mm -hmm. uh, the student movement in the South, and we were a, a small part of that, uh, I think uh, inspired a lot of people and uh, I think we had, uh, I mean, there are many people that were part of Mississippi Summer mm -hmm. in, in 64 that went on, became uh, leaders of the anti-war movement, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and most of those people that I was uh, part of the uh, sit-ins, the ones that are still alive, uh, continued to be very active in the civil rights movement were on the Freedom Rides, spent months in prison in, in Mississippi during Mississippi summer. And so um, I think another lesson uh, was, you know, when people together uh, speak out and act, uh, I mean, you can support each other and, and inspire each other and uh, keep your eyes on the prize rather than, I mean, one lone person, as we saw with Greta, can do something, but mm -hmm. <laughs> for most of us, if we have a support group, it's, it's much easier. So, um, you are a Quaker, and um, I interviewed George Lakey earlier, he's also a Quaker, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering how has your Quaker faith inspired and sustained you in your nonviolent activism? I mean, I think it's, it's partly uh, the role models that I had. Mm. People like Byron Rustin and uh, A.J. Musty and, you know, some of them were Quakers, <laughs> some of them were, were not. Mm -hmm. uh, King and Abernethy and, um, and the farm workers movement. I just think these to me were role models of mm -hmm. what I felt I'd like to be mm -hmm. in life. I mean, becoming a millionaire never really was <laughs> 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 a goal that I, you know, inspired me. Or uh, 
you know, working in the State Department or <laughs> Pentagon or, you know, anything else. That, and getting to know people that uh, had served years in prison mm -hmm. for refusing to, to, to uh, go to war, including two people in a Quaker meeting that I was a part of when I was in fourth, fifth grade. Mm -hmm. To to Paul and David Seaver, who had refused to go in the Korean War. Um, but I think the Quaker belief that uh, we not only kind of do our religion on uh, Sundays at 11 o'clock, but it's something you live. And uh, we have what we call queries or questions. You know, uh, how am I trying to follow God's leading in my life and, mm -hmm. and, and practice that? And, um, and to feel a support group of other Quakers. Mm -hmm. I mean, during the Vietnam War with Quakers, I was involved in uh, reading the names of war dead on the Capitol steps and getting arrested <laughs> one Wednesday after another. Um, and later in, uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, when the U.S. started bombing Hanoi and Haiphong, you know, a bunch of us that were in a Quaker community in Philadelphia uh, just got together for a worship service trying to, uh, to feel in our souls how the people and how the families in, in Vietnam and Hanoi and Haiphong what it was like for them, feel that deep in our hearts. And then uh, together looked at uh, what, uh, what we were led to do to try to uh, challenge that mm -hmm. and found the support, the, the inspiration that somehow we needed to put our, our bodies between these bombs and the, the people in Hanoi and Haiphong that were going to get killed. <laughs> and uh, that was the beginning of the People's Blockade, where uh, we started blocking ships, carrying uh, bombs and munitions, napalm, anti-personal bombs, et cetera, to Vietnam, and inspired people all the way up and down the East and West Coast to begin doing the same thing. And that first ship, uh, when uh, the ship was about to lift anchor, or it was starting to lift anchor to leave for Vietnam, uh, and we were there paddling <laughs> our canoes to try to stay right in front of it, lo and behold, seven of the sailors jumped off the bow of the ship into the ocean and started sw swimming toward us. And um, I think, I think that our courage gave them courage mm -hmm. to do what their heart <laughs> was, <laughs> their conscience was telling them to do. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, um, I think the the belief, the, I think the, a Quaker belief is that we are all children of God and mm -hmm. we're all one human family. Uh, and I, I, I mean, that's a very deep belief for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, these boundaries that uh, when I lived in Berlin, <laughs> you know, in East Berlin, I was going to the university there, there was lots of propaganda about how horrible the people in the West were, the capitalist war mongers. Mm -hmm. And it, it, in the West, it was the, the, how terrible the communists, <laughs> communists were. I, I think these boundaries of communist versus capitalist, of Iranian versus uh, U.S. Chinese versus U.S. Russians versus U.S. Uh, Muslim versus Christian and Hindu versus Muslim, etc. I mean, this is all propaganda mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, we, we all end up thinking we are the best <laughs> and we have the right religion and the right nationality. And uh, we are special, and I think we especially have this problem in the United States. Mm -hmm. We're the exceptional country. 
And uh, of course, our nuclear weapons are for peaceful purposes. <laughs> and it's these other people who are terrible people, of course, we could not trust them to have nuclear weapons, etc. cetera. And uh, at any rate, um, I hope that responds to that question. <laughs> If you enjoyed this conversation, please check out part two. You can find the link in the video description below. If you think these conversations are important and would like to see them continue, please consider supporting NVI and the work we do by subscribing to this YouTube channel, following us on Twitter and Facebook, and visiting our website. Also, please consider donating to our organization. Every little bit counts to help build a more just and nonviolent world.